All right, the last section in chapter four, hallelujah, brother. We're gonna talk about equilibrium. We hopefully will not lose our equilibrium while we do it. Let's define it. An object is in equilibrium when it has zero acceleration. You say, what? Well, that's not very hard. If the acceleration is zero, then it's in equilibrium, right? And I say, right. If the acceleration is zero, then guess what happens with Newton's second law? Sum on forces in the x direction, the net force in the x direction equals mass times acceleration in the x direction, well that's zero. So you're just gonna get zero. Same thing for the forces in the y direction. If all of the, if the acceleration is zero, then the forces will add up to zero. Let's do an, uh, Oh, a quick example, a plane moves with constant velocity at an angle of 30 degrees, and I think I've assigned a homework problem on, like this. It's moving at a constant velocity. So I'd like to emphasize that in your brain. At an angle of 30 degrees, above the horizontal, due to the action of four forces, the weight, the lift, is perpendicular to the surface of the wings. The thrust, that's the action of the engines pushing it forward, and the air resistance, R. It is, an, is it in equilibrium? Here's all the forces, it's complicated. Free body diagram, um, is it in equilibrium? What do you think? Yes. You say, how can it possibly be in equilibrium? It's accelerating upward, and when I say it's not accelerating, it's going at constant velocity. So that pilot has adjusted his controls, or her controls, so that he or she is moving at a constant velocity in that 30 degree direction. And in that case, given the fact that the, constant, uh, the velocity is constant, if the velocity is constant, then guess what? The velocity is not changing. And guess what? The acceleration is zero. So in this case, we can determine that it's in equilibrium based on the fact that it has constant velocity. But knowing that the acceleration is zero, knowing that it's in equilibrium, makes our job of solving for the forces a lot easier because we don't have to worry about the acceleration. Small plane, uh, this is essentially the same problem. Small plane increases its altitude by flying with a constant velocity at an angle theta, so the same problem. With respect to the horizontal, which one of the following statements is true concerning the magnitude of the net force on the plane? Same problem, but a little different question. Pausing the video. Resuming the video. Which one's right? Well, what can we say about the magnitude of the net force on the plane? Is it equal to the weight of the plane? Mm -mm. Why is that Newton's first law says that an object in, in motion with constant velocity will remain in motion with that same constant velocity and let, unless acted on by a net force. So if the velocity is constant, the acceleration is zero, the net force must therefore be zero. Net force is mass times acceleration. If the velocity is constant, the acceleration must be zero because it's the change in the velocity and then the net force must therefore be zero. So that's false, it can't be right. Is it, it is equal to the magnitude of the force of air resistance. No, can't possibly be right. It's equal to zero newtons, and that is right. That's true. It's less than the weight of the plane, but greater than zero. It's equal to the component of the weight of the plane. So it's a lot. Actually, once you get a handle on what the net force is and its relationship with the acceleration and constant velocity, 
These problems tend to be pretty simple once you get them. Um, here's an example involving uh, an equilibrium application of Newton's laws of motion. This is a foot in traction. And um, so we've got two ropes, a pulley, two different tensions acting on this pulley. And we've got a weight down here that's providing the tension force in this string. And we're hoping that the string is massless and the pulleys are frictionless so that the magnitude of these two tensions is going to be the same. Well, let's look at the hanging mass. This one right here. So it's this mass that I want to look at first. And remember, with Newton's second law, you must identify a particular body that you're going to apply it to. Look at all the forces on that body, and then uh, plug in its mass, and then that will be the way that you can find its acceleration or balance the forces. So. We're interested in this body now. The two forces on it are the gravity pulling it down and the tension pulling it up. So the sum on forces in the y direction, T is in the plus y direction, mg is in the minus y direction, and those equal zero because it's in equilibrium. So T is mg. And because that force, that tension force, transmits undiminished throughout the whole rope, We've also found not only the tension right here in the rope, but also the magnitude of the tension here and here. And they all equal mg. It's great. So let's look at the pulley now. Now we're going to look at forces on the pulley. This pulley. And here's a, I've translated this diagram over to here. And um, here's the two tensions of the two ropes, T1 and T2. And then this is the force. Um, this is actually, this force is the force of the foot pulling against the pulley. And ultimately, really what we're looking for is the pulleys pulling against the foot. And so, the force that really matters here in, in providing the traction to, to set that bone is equal and opposite to this force of the foot on the pulley. It's the force of the foot. Okay, so uh, let's choose a coordinate system. So in this case, we used a coordinate system x and y to, to study this part for the forces in the y direction, because both of those forces lined up with the y direction. Over here, it makes more sense to use a different coordinate system. And this is allowed. You can use a different coordinate system when analyzing forces on different bodies. This is often done. It saves you time, saves you energy. Um, let's take the x direction in, along the same line as the force between the, the uh, this traction and the foot. So this force F of the foot on the pulley will be in the negative x direction. And then the y, so this is plus x, and this is plus y. And so now we just balance the forces. And this is a little bit of algebra, but we're all happy to do it. The sum on the forces in the x direction. Well, it's like the example we did before. T1 cosine 35. That's the component of T1 in the x direction. T1 cosine 35, right there. T2 cosine 35. Here's the component of this force, T2, in the x direction. This is 35. This is 35. Reason we're using cosine is that we need the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And the adjacent uh, requires the cosine. So that's this one. Both of these point, 
uh, both of these components, this one and this one, point in the plus x direction. But there's one other force in the x direction, and that's f. And it points in the minus x direction. So that's why this one appears here. Do the same thing with y. Uh, what are the components of these forces in the y direction? Well, T1 sine 35 in the plus y direction. Here's y. And T2 sine 35 in the minus y direction. This one here, that, that component right there, equals 0. Well, luckily, we know Let's see, mass. We know that T1 and T2 are both equal to T, and T is equal to mg. So let's see how we actually went about doing the algebra here. OK, we're going to solve this equation for f. Let's bring the f over to the right-hand side. And then um, notice first that this equation tells me absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, if you take this term over to the right-hand side, then you have t1 sine 35 equals t2 sine 35. Well, we already knew that t1 equals t2, so that just basically says that uh, it doesn't give us any more information. But this is the one that does give us information. We take the f over to the right-hand side, this T1 can be replaced with T. This T2 can be replaced with T. And so we end up with 2T cosine 35. So that's this equation here. With this equation being exactly the same as what I just said, except replacing T with mg. So then all we have to do is plug the numbers in. There's the 2, there's the m, there's g is 9.8, then cosine of 35. And again, this 9.8 didn't come out from the acceleration like it does in, in chapter 3. It comes from the weight of the object. Uh, the acceleration in this particular case is 0. It's in equilibrium. Yep. All right, this is another example. Um, I don't think I'll go through this one in detail. I think it's worked out in your book. Um, just another case where we have a weight, a couple of tensions, different angles. Uh, you can practice on those on your own. This I would like to do, however. A truck hauls a trailer along a level road. Find the tension in the drawbar between them. So this is the drawbar between the truck and the trailer. The force of the engine driving the truck forward. So this is the force of the engine driving the truck forward, D, it's called in this figure. If we take x to be uh, to the right, then that's nice because we, um, well, we just have motion in one direction. So let's look at the forces on the trailer and on the truck in the x direction. So I'm interested. We could worry about the normal force and the, um, those other forces in the y direction, but we actually don't need them for this particular problem. So let's just look at the forces. So if we want to do a complete free body diagram, we've got a normal force here. We got um, m2g, gravity of this trailer acting down. And there might be some drag or whatever, but we're not, we're not worried about drag or resistance. And if we only are concerned with the forces in the x direction, then this is the only force in the x direction, this tension force. That's the tension of the drawbar as it draws this trailer along. Now note that we're going to have to uh, assume that the drawbar is massless in this particular problem. So, but it's not a difficult assumption because that mass of the drawbar is going to be much smaller compared to much, it would be, be small compared with the mass of either the trailer or the truck. All right, so this is Newton's second law. Uh, sum of forces in the x direction is mass of the trailer 
times the acceleration of the trailer. This is the forces on the trailer, the mass of the trailer, the acceleration of the trailer. Important to make, uh, make those um, clear each time you're writing down Newton's second law. The only force in the x direction on this trailer is the tension. And it's pointing in the plus x direction. So I put it in as a positive. OK? Equals the mass of the trailer. That's what we call m2 times the acceleration of the trailer. Well, we actually, um, OK, so we're given the acceleration, 0.78 meters per second squared. So I need the component, and, and bear, stay with me here, and you see the whites of your eyes. The component of this acceleration in this direction, will it be positive or negative? You say, well, OK, acceleration is that way, x direction is that way. So the x component of the acceleration has to be positive. And sure enough, you're right. So it's, we put it in as a positive 0.78 meters per second squared. That gives the tension in the drawbar. That's how much tension is in this drawbar here. We assume, based on a uh, massless drawbar, that that tension transmits undiminished across the drawbar so that the truck is pulling the trailer with a tension of 21,000 newtons. The trailer is trying to pull back on the truck with that same amount of force. That's not because of Newton's third law. It's because this tension is being uh, transmitted undiminished. Um, actually, you can get the same result from Newton's second law, or Newton's third law. All right, but anyway, the truck now, what are its forces in the x direction? You don't have to worry about the normal or uh, the gravity. We've got its uh, driving force pushing it forward. This tension force holding it back. And, and that's why you can't accelerate as fast in a truck when you have a trailer. It's because of that, that tension force is, is holding you back. Minus t prime. We use a t prime here because the direction of that is not the same as the direction of, the direction of this force is not the same as the direction of that force. But their magnitudes are the same. Equals the mass of the truck times the acceleration. So now we can solve this equation for this driving force D by adding T prime to both sides of the equation. We add it to the left side, and the, T, the minus T prime plus T prime add up to 0. So on the left side, we just get D. On the right side, we've added T prime, and there's where it ends up. Plug the numbers in. We know what T prime is. It's the same. T prime is the magnitude. This is the magnitude. They're the same because it transmits undiminished. Uh, mass of the truck, acceleration of the truck, they're both accelerating at the same rate. And so this gives a forward driving force. So notice that this uh, driving force of the engine is 28,000 newtons. A lot of that force is being used up by the trailer, which is pulling it back by, by 21,000 newtons. The other uh, important message with this problem is that the truck and the trailer are accelerating at the same rate. They're both accelerating at 0.78 meters per second squared. Why is that? Well, at any given time, they're both going to be moving at the same velocity. And if their velocities are always the same, then their accelerations must always be the same. If their velocities are the same, then the way that their velocities change must also be the same. So they're both going to be accelerating in the same rate. And that's based on the assumption that this drawbar is inextensible. We're not stretching the drawbar out or, or having it break, which would um, invalidate that assumption. Under what conditions will an object be in equilibrium? OK, great question. Pause, resume. An object, remember for it to be in equilibrium, the acceleration has to be 0. OK, 
can you only get that case if it's at rest? The answer is no. You can also get it if it's moving at constant velocity. Only is if it's moving with constant velocity. Well, that's not true because you can also get uh, equilibrium when it's at rest. Only it's moving with constant acceleration. Well, what about that one? Well, hang on. What does constant acceleration mean? It means that there is an acceleration. But we've got to have zero acceleration. So this can't possibly be true. You can't have any acceleration. It has to have zero acceleration for it to be in equilibrium. Acceleration means that the velocity is changing, remember? It's either at rest or moving with constant velocity, true. It's either moving with a constant velocity or with a constant acceleration. Um, not true, because it has to be a zero acceleration. I'm hoping that these clicker questions will help you uh, prepare well for the tests, um, given that they're conceptual.